Hello, Phil, and thank you for joining us today. Great pleasure. Perhaps if we could uh, find out a bit more about Rockwell Collins and what they do and what uh, you're bringing to Soldier Tech. Yeah, sure. Um, Rockwell Collins actually is a US company. We were formed in 1933 in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, founder Arthur Collins was a, a radio ham. Uh, built a number of um, amateur radios which actually got into military use and that's how Rockwell began in communications. We are essentially a communications company. Uh, we moved into avionics throughout the Second World War, navigation systems. Ultimately that led us into the development and production of the global positioning system. Um, Rockwell Collins launched the first satellites, built the first receiver and since then Rockwell really has stayed at the forefront of military GPS. So obviously I can see a few of them in front of us. Perhaps if we take a look at your, your table. Yes, sure. Um, I suppose I can't really talk about military GPS without talking about Dagger. Um, it's the world's most prolific military GPS receiver. Um, being military, it's slightly larger than you would anticipate. Uh, it's, it's bigger than your, your camping GPS is. But there again, it has to be soldier proof. Um, it has to run on AA batteries, therefore um, that somewhat drives the size of the receiver. Um, I think there are something like a quarter of a million of these in military service worldwide right now, so it really is a sort of mainstay military GPS. Um, moving from Dagger, we have a new device which has just been released called Micro Dagger. Um, you can see the size of it in comparison to Dagger. Let me just put that down. Um, I suppose the most noticeable thing, size, uh, we've gone from four AA cells down to two, and it's a colour receiver. Um, show me a soldier nowadays that has anything that's monochrome, um, and you can imagine uh, that the, the dagger being a monochrome screen isn't the most popular of receivers. This, however, is, is just what they like. It's colour, it's small, we can load maps onto it. It has a digital magnetic compass built into it. So it becomes a navigation device connected to a radio. It tells me where I am, it tells all my troops um, where I am and where they are. So it's, it's a very flexible piece of equipment. It also kind of proves the, the, the ruggedness of the touch screen. Yes, yes. I mean, I think uh, uh, if a soldier can break something, and I say that because I was one, um, certainly they will. So uh, it's a challenge building this sort of equipment for military use. Um, just as a brief aside, um, as, as well as the uh, military handhelds, that's an embedded GPS receiver. Uh, this is actually the Bowman GPS receiver. It's in all the Bowman radios. Um, we actually, as a company, transitioned the manufacturer from the US to the UK, and there are 40-something thousand of these now in service throughout the Bowman program. So, um, As a company, uh, most recently, we've been providing the standard close air support system for our troops, a uh, system over there called Firestorm. Uh, it's used for both our forward air controllers and our forward artillery observers. Um, they use the laser rangefinder obviously to identify and mark the position of a target. Then they can generate what's called a, a NATO 9 line, which is a special targeting message for aircraft on the computer. And then that's connected to a radio. It's automatically transmitted to the aircraft for the airstrike. Um, they will then drop a GPS guided weapon and because of the accuracy of the system, it will drop within five meters of the indicated target. Um, five metres uh, with a large precision guided missile is, is, is really not much. Now I have to ask just because I can see it right behind you, you've got a, a, an amazing headset right there, what, if you could perhaps talk us through that quickly. Yeah, um, one of the other things that Rockwell Collins is involved in is simulation. Um, we make everything from full motion simulations for, for aircraft, rotary wing for vehicles, uh, and also for, for smaller immersive systems for troops. Um, the headset over there is connected to uh, a commercially available game. It has um, a binocular view, so you have two displays in front of the user. Uh, and then it's head, if I can just, uh, we have a head tracker on here. And if you can see on the screen, as I move the helmet, the display is moving as well. Um, Therefore, rather than just um, static training for troops, we can actually get them more involved in the um, synthetic environment of the training. Um, frankly, my son loves it and wishes he could have one, but uh, I'm afraid his pocket money doesn't quite run to that. If I could just ask you, uh, from your position, what kind of trends have you been seeing from the various military organisations that speak to you? Uh, what technologies are they looking for at the moment? Um, it, it tends to vary, but I think, uh, obviously, bearing in mind British forces heavily engaged in Afghanistan, um, 
I think it's probably not unfair to say that if the product or system or capability doesn't aid the mission in Afghanistan, um, it's probably not seeing all the funding that it could nowadays. Um, urgent operational requirements, UORs, um, are really what's driving our business right now. So, in terms of um, modularization versus integration, which seems to be somewhere, but a, a, a sort of a, a major, well, at least a major talking point, if not some kind of a battle, what do you see as the most important part of that to get right? I think. It, it, it's been that way for many years. Um, I've seen, for example, the Bowman program and things like uh, US Land Warrior, FIST, German IDZ, all of the future soldier programs go through their, their pain and their, their development. Um, one of the obvious challenges is that there is not one company that makes all of that technology. Therefore, there is a certain amount of, of national interest, there's a certain amount of commercial interest, because obviously my company wants to provide the lion's share of what it can, so do all my competitors and my partners. Therefore, deep integration is a challenge, because sometimes, unfortunately, one company's equipment doesn't talk to another company's equipment. There is technical overlap, uh, there are physical boundaries to, to connectivity, so it is a challenge, it has to be said. So if I can just ask them one last question on that note, standardisation, is that something that gets talked about much within the industry? All the time, all the time. Uh, again though, um, uh, I'm ex-military myself, but I, I have to admit, we've probably not been as clever at that as we could uh, for all the aforementioned reasons I just mentioned. Um, we're looking now at soldier standardisation, obviously we're here at the soldier show. Um, but again, you have national interests, you have physical difficulties, different connectors, uh, batteries are a major issue, power is still an absolute major issue because um, uh, until we find batteries that are extremely small, extremely light, um, soldiers are extremely challenged to carry um, all the different batteries into the field. Well, thank you very much for your time today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Not at all, my pleasure. Thank you very much.